Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 189. Can we meet kids where they are without lowering standards? With Jonathan Talberg. Recently, a Facebook post dialogue of sorts went viral amongst music educators between Juilliard professor Jeffrey Kieser and James Falzone. Professor Kieser made a relatively short post related to the problems he is seeing in his teaching position related to reliability and accountability for students. It resonated with thousands of people as it got shared and discussed, but for some, it kind of had a kids these days grouchy feeling to it, so not everyone responded sympathetically. Enter James Falzone to this conversation. He crafted an essay encouraging a much more introspective approach to the very real issue that Professor Kieser was speaking to. That's where this episode comes in. I was clued into this discourse when I saw it shared by this week's guest, Dr. Jonathan Talberg. Jonathan has decades of experience and reputation teaching at the post-secondary level with great choirs and excellent quality of work that he asked from his students. So I asked him to join me to parse out some nuance in this discussion. We wrestle with questions about tough love and holding students accountable. How do these ideas mesh with this generation of students and their changing needs, values, and sensibilities? And maybe most importantly, how do we navigate all of this while not lowering our academic standards? So tune in and have your thinking stimulated and challenged. Then weigh in yourself on Facebook in the Coralosophers group or over on coralosophy.substack.com. I'm excited to tell you about Ludus.com, a new platform designed for the performing arts by people from the arts. With Ludus, you'll have access to a friendly, knowledgeable customer success team that's available when you need them. And the best part? There are no setup costs, contracts, or hidden fees. It's 100% free to your program, so why not give it a try and see how Ludus can help you streamline your operations and put the focus back on your passion for the arts. Coralosophy listeners can go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy for an upgrade for free to their marketing suite. I am really excited to announce, after many requests, there is now a Coralosophy merch store. All you need to do is go to the website, coralosophy.com, look for the shop button in the top. You can find Literacy is Equity shirts and sweatshirts and signs for your room. You can find the Thank You for Your Mistake signs, which I love to put on the wall of a classroom, as well as a variety of other show designs. And you can sport your Coralosopher status by going to coralosophy.com forward slash shop and checking out the store there. Patreon members really keep this show going financially every month, making sure all the costs are covered out of pocket. But they also get access to my Google folder of goodies, the private podcast feed. They find out who's coming on the show ahead of time and a variety of other fun little conversations that we're able to have over on the Patreon page. The producers and inner circle at Patreon are Brannigan Lawrence, Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, Jonah Clicksbull, Angie Schilling, David Kowalsik, DF... Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. Uh, just make sure I get it. Uh, is it Talberg or d- is that is it just the way it looks? Do I pronounce it f- phonetically? It depends upon if you're pronouncing it the way my Michigan family does or the way my California family does. We all say Talberg. Talberg. Ta- Talberg. Okay. Is Talberg. that Mich- is that Michigan or California? No, the Michiganders say Talberg. Talberg. Oh yeah, like yeah, you're yeah. Chi- like near Chicago. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. So they're they're from up north, but yeah. So yeah, Talbert is good. Talbert, okay, that's great. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll just jump right in, and and like I said, um, pivoting. I appreciate you pivoting. I think this conversation could be really fun, and just uh, you know, um, talking about what we see with uh, quote unquote kids these days. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I I had a day. It's a good. You never know how your day's gonna. Go and I had one of those rehearsals today where I'm like, okay, well here we are. Make the best music with the people we can in front of us. Yeah. So tell me about that. So you had so since that's going to be kind of our topic, let's start there. Where you had a rehearsal today and wasn't as you planned, I'm assuming. And what's the story? Yeah. Well, we're we're doing a concert about love, and it's it features a fantastic new premiere or premiere by Jake Runestead. And I'm really excited about that particular piece with the chamber choir and the university choir, which is mostly freshmen and sophomores and a few first year transfers. Uh, The university choir is doing all sorts of different kinds of love songs. And I'm doing uh, two of the Aaron Copeland pieces from A Tenderland. Mm -hmm. So um, we were working on The Promise of Living today. 
And uh, the basses and tenors were just all over the place. It's so much so that I ended up just feeling my frustration rising as choir directors do. And I just thought, I, I don't want to waste the time with the sopranos and altos. So I just excused the sopranos and altos and said, all right, basses and tenors, we got we got 15 minutes to learn this. And it was supposed to be prepared. I mean, they, they should have they had looked at it in sectionals on Friday. But I don't know what didn't happen in their sectionals on Friday. Um, they came in and they just didn't know it. And so I thought, you know, I can be, get upset about this or I can circle them around the piano and we can we can spend 15 minutes working on it. And uh, and I did that. And at the end of that time, I said, OK, well, just so you guys know, I'm going to hear this in trios because it's, it's a it's a TBB section. I said, I'll hear this in trios on Thursday and uh, be ready. Yes. Uh, so, you know, a little accountability is, is really helpful, I think. Oh, for sure. For sure. So before we uh, continue to explore this, I want I would like for you to, since we're still kind of uh, getting the audience acclimated to this idea that we're going to talk about kind of um, thoughts about academic accountability, uh, ways that that has changed, uh, or has it uh, over the last generation, right? We can kind of hash out some of those ideas. Uh, before we get into that, though, uh, where do you teach so that the audience has that frame of reference that they know that I, I teach high school, you teach at the college level. Tell us where you are and, and what's the name of your school, all that stuff. Okay, so I have been for 24 years uh, the director of choral activities at California State University, Long Beach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, before that, I was at the University of Cincinnati as a graduate assistant for, for four years. And before that, I taught high school for five years in Southern California, um, four in Garden Grove at a Title I school and one year at, at the Los Angeles County High School of the Arts. So very different high school experiences. Wow. And, yeah. Uh, you know, at Long Beach State, I, I was fortunate to, to get a really fantastic four-year public university job one year out of my doctorate. And uh, I've been really happy there and had the opportunity to to build a really fine program, I think. And it's the yeah. program that I wish I had had when I went to undergrad. It's, you know, it's, it's principally an undergraduate program. We take four graduate students maximum in the conducting area. Um, but it, the undergraduate program uh, is usually about 100 majors, either in vocal performance, jazz voice, opera voice, or or choral music education. So yeah. lots of majors. That's great. That's really cool. And, and I've heard um, your choirs, and they're fantastic, and you're doing wonderful work there. Um, I've known about that for years. Now, um, what I wonder is kind of hinting at my first question, which was... Um, this idea of what we can expect from our students, like you mentioned in your story about uh, students being told to come knowing a certain portion of the music and they didn't come, and as a result, you then have to change your rehearsal plan by adding 15 minutes of what should be, let's go back and do stuff we were already supposed to know. Is, is I, Now, in my experience, I'll just kind of interject that that type of thing has, has happened my entire 20-plus year teaching career. That's not That in itself isn't new. I see, though, a difference now, at even between the students now and 10 years ago, in how frequently that happens. Is that something that you see have seen a change? Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, Chris, I, I would say that I have not seen a huge change mm. in students being prepared, certainly not in my top group. In the Bob Cole Chamber Choir, they're prepared for rehearsals. Um, in the University Choir, which is the second the second auditioned ensemble, um, you know, there, it's always give and take and it depends upon what else is happening in the conservatory. You know, if a lot of them are in opera, then maybe that year that people aren't as prepared, you know, when it comes into, into the production weeks. Um, but generally people are prepared. What I notice is a different response to my calling them out when they're not prepared. Hmm. And that I have to be gentler than I used to be. Um, and 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 that a lack of um, a lack of understanding doesn't necessarily yield results. And uh, I know that we we came at this from the the two posts that had been circulating on Facebook about you know one is one I kind of summarized as kids. I don't know what's wrong with these kids today. And and, and the other one is you know a, a slightly different take, a little bit more you know, measure in love sort of um, way of looking at the world to use two different musical theater analogies that don't necessarily go together. 
Um, but I do think that that the students are changing. They have changed. The post COVID world is different. Um, the cell phone world is different. For your students, um, the fact that they can never really get away from the dramas of school because they follow them home on social media, yep. that's huge. And, you know, we've you, you've talked about that with other guests on the show. And and I talk about that at, at workshops across the country. And, I, you know, it's something to be aware of. But we still have to teach the ensemble that's in front of us. Yes. And, we have to teach the students that we have, and we have to bring them to a, a standard of excellence as we understand it to be. And I think that every rehearsal, I think to myself, they will sing as badly as I let them. If I want to put it in the negative, right? You know, we have to insist on, on, on good singing. So um, I want them to sing beautifully and connectedly and all of those things in every rehearsal. And um, so... I, that's that hasn't changed in my years right. oh yeah no that's well said and i think uh, and i agree with all of that uh the, the in the the commentary that you just gave uh, i want to go back a little bit because you mentioned in your top group the preparation level hasn't really changed as much over the years in other words the people who come to that group have a repu they're they're coming to an ensemble that has a reputation that that they know ahead of time there's an expectation you can keep uh you know you can keep that afloat I, I see that at the high school level in my, my chamber choir, for the most part, over the course of the pandemic. So if I'm going back four school years now, um, my chamber choir has been able to maintain a standard. Right. Uh, the other ensembles, not so much. And, and what I find interesting about that, and I started noticing it actually during the pandemic, was actually a widening of equity gaps between the the have students and the have not students during that time and it might be different at the college level but in some ways um, a college professor might not see all of that because the kids that are m the most prepared at the high school level are the ones that get into the music program you know oftentimes at the college level because what i noticed was that during online school and during some of the the trauma of that time my kids who were already taking voice lessons, they were already good at singing, they were already in love with choir, they were the ones who were coming to to the online offerings and coming to the Zoom meetings and doing the extra literacy lessons online and, and taking my stupid overtone series class that I was doing during the online online class because there's only so many things that you can do during that time. And, and they came through that pandemic period. And this actually for me is my kids that graduated last year. Um, they, they were the most advanced high school students I've ever taught. But the problem is only about 20% of my kids overall even came to those offerings. Um, and, and so then the rest of the kids that didn't come to those because no one made them, um, they, they know less. And so that's kind of a long story, but I guess what I'm uh, floating just to see your reaction to, uh, is it possible that we are all seeing some portion of that and we have our top our top choirs that are still great but it's the it's the everyone else that maybe is affected more by these changes in in the education that we're delivering hmm. i mean i i would say that i had a similar experience to you during the pandemic and that for the first time maybe in in my teaching since i taught in the inner city i really understood that students were coming from from different um backgrounds. I mean, because you could see we had a student in, in choir in our Zoom choir who was duct taping a phone to a tree outside to get away from their family. And then we had another student who has a music room with a Steinway in the living room. You know, right. These are yeah. students from the same choir. And and I don't think I would ever have known that, you know, because I don't, you know, they, they're coming from all over to go to Cal State Long Beach. I, I wouldn't have known that there was that disparity in income. I don't know how that disparity in income plays into who makes the top group at my university. I'm not sure it does, you know. And in fact, I know that some of the students in our top group were students who were who were scholarshiped for outstanding talent, and some were scholarship for needs based talent, and they're still in 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 the top group. So I I don't know, you know, how those disparities play themselves out in 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 the in the choirs um, or in preparation. I will say that it's not uncommon for a student to email me at a time and say, I know we're doing, I know you're doing um, 
quartets today. I just need you to know that I worked all weekend at two jobs and I don't know the music yet, but I'll prepare it for Thursday. And which could you not call on me? <laughs> right. And I don't, and I don't. If they've yeah. got the presence of mind to tell me, I mean, I worked in college. I, I get that. I really do understand what that's like when you have a whole weekend, you know, of, of trying to make up for not being able to take shifts during the week because of, because of class. Um, but again, I don't know that that's changed more. Maybe we're a little bit more aware of it than we used to be. Yeah. Now that's a good example, though, because I would consider that student who who sent you that email in advance of the test to be uh, a, a an adult responsible behavior. Uh, like, and so I don't even know. And maybe this is actually a good time to go into those posts because that's where you kind of we kind of uh, get into the details of what is a situation that uh, that warrants calling a student out, so to speak, on being unprepared, and what is a situation where it it's not warranted. And I would say in the example you gave, uh, a student has the wherewithal, like you said, to let you know ahead of time that this is not going to be ready on time. There is a reason, but it also shows you that they care that it gets learned. That's right. Um, and and to me, and it's a growth. It's a growth mindset that we understand as teachers yes. that we respect. And I'm going to do everything I can to protect that student from from demonstrating to the choir that they're not ready yet. Right. Um, and knowing that that they will be, and that that would be true in both of the ensembles that I teach at school. Yeah. Yeah. We would never, we, I don't think we as educators would ever want to punish a kid for that, um, for essentially for doing the wrong thing. And that's true for parents too. We don't want to punish our kid when they do the right thing. Um, right. And, and <laughs> because that sends, uh, sends some very conf conflicted meth messages. Um, okay. Let me, let me get us into these posts here. So this will just take a second because I want to make sure that everybody who's listening, even if they did not are, if they're not Facebook trolls, um, we'll know exactly what we're talking about. So there was a hubbub on Facebook and I saw that you had posted about it. So that's one of the reasons I asked to talk with you about it. I thought it'd be good to bounce these ideas around with you. There was first a post by a person named Jeffrey Keezer and he is a teacher, I understand, at Juilliard. Um, Sorry, teaches, he teaches jazz piano. Say again? He teaches jazz piano. Jazz and piano. He, world class artist, you know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. How yeah. the kind of, kind of jazz pianist? Yep. Yeah, that's great. And, and I'm going to read, uh, read a portion of this post for, uh, so that the listening audience that doesn't read can have some context. I teach at one of the preeminent, hardest to get into music schools in the world, with supposedly the cream of the crop of music students intent on having a career in music when they graduate. Yet, they can't be bothered to show up on time for a 9.30 a.m. class. Nothing but lame excuses. The trains were messed up. Was up hanging at Smalls until 3 a.m. My heater is broken. Ad nauseum. And when they do show up a half hour late, if at all, they haven't practiced and are unprepared. So I ask you students, how do you expect to have a career when you graduate if you can't get up in the morning? How are you going to make a 6 a.m. lobby call on tour to get to the airport for an 8 a.m. flight? And it goes on to kind of list some of these and also goes on later to lament the everybody gets an A culture that we have kind of uh, moved ourselves into. And at the end, he says, get your act together and practice your assignments, do the work and show up. Uh, so it's, a, you know, there's a little bit of a old man, stay off my lawn, kind of a, or get off my lawn, kind of a vibe to the language of the post. Uh, I will put the whole thing in the show notes so that people can, uh, can see it and read on their own. Now, the thing that I was interested in is that um, outside of the tone uh, I think he makes some really, really important points. Yet there was an, a rebuttal that comes later um, that we can talk about. But what was your initial reaction to that post? How did you interpret it? Don't forget, music educators can save money when they use the Coralosophy discount code at websites they should probably be going to anyway. Those websites are sightreadingfactory.com for your membership and your students' memberships, which is crucial, mymusicfolders.com anytime you need choir folders or other paraphernalia, and sheet music at graphitepublishing.com and endeavorpublishing.com. So my initial reaction was that we all want our students to be responsible musicians and teachers. If we're talking about a university or Juilliard, we're training students, um, you know, both at, at my school and, and at, at most music schools to do one of two things for the most part, to be professional musicians or to be professional teachers. And professionals show up on time 
professionals turn in, you know, their their request for buses on time and they get their programs in on time. And so that is a really important skill set. The thing that struck me as really interesting about the professor's complaint is that, you know, one of the things that he uses as an example for why a student would be wouldn't be in class is they were out at smalls until three o'clock in the morning. And so for me as a musician, I think, well, if he's teaching jazz piano and a student says to him, I'm sorry, I missed class, but I was at smalls until, you know, three o'clock in the morning taking in jazz, you know, in, in the city. I find myself weighing those two things because what are what are they going to learn in class, you know, versus what did they learn where jazz has traditionally been taught, which is in the clubs. Um, and, and so I thought that was a very strange, um, you know, choice from him. For And to put that into context, if a student said to me, Dr. T, I'm really sorry that I was late. I was I was at the Master Chorale concert last night and it was B minor mass. And, you know, it's long and I didn't get out in time. And I'm really sorry that I was late to class. I would say, so how was the concert? You know, what did you learn? What did you hear? What did you see? That's where I think that he's missing missing the point a little bit, maybe in mm. his students. Because my question, and this is raised by by the next post that you're going to ask is what isn't the professor teaching that the students think that they need, you know, or, or why aren't they coming to that class? Is, is it just the professional hazing of the 8 a.m. theory class, which most of us had as music majors, you know, and I still try to understand why theories at 8 a.m. at most universities or the piano sequences at 9 a.m. And, and the answer is there's only so many hours of the day in the day. So you've got to put those classes at some point. But I, I had a dean say to me once we, you know, we put theory at, at 8 a.m. so we could wean out the people who don't have what it takes to, to um, you know, make it as, as music majors. But I, for one, was doing professional musical theater in, in, in college. And I didn't get home till after midnight and getting to an eight o'clock class was difficult for me. I did it because mm -hmm. I, I wanted that degree more than than anything. Um, yeah. But I do think a little compassion. I, I think that the post lacks compassion. And I do think that it doesn't ask the question of why. Why are the students not coming to your class? Right. I mean, I, I have a nine o'clock class and mo most of the students are there most of the time. Um, it's a conducting class for music educators and they show up, um, but it's at nine o'clock. And I like to think, maybe I'm putting too much credence in my teaching, but I like to think that they're there because they're learning something that they see as really being valuable in their future career as, as music educators. Right, yeah, no, that's really good. And I think um, in as I'm reading the post, I, I have some slightly different reactions in that um, and this is just where a lot of things are in the eye of the beholder, is I feel like I would be assuming um, a lot of things to interpret uh, to, to interpret out of that. So let me give an example. Um, with the Smalls example, uh, the, of some, a student who's a jazz student and they're uh, at a jazz club until 3 a.m. And I agree with your example. Like, uh, students at a you know, choir concert, master chorale concert, and, and they're they're late and they apologize for being late and they have this reason that to me is a very different scenario than what is possibly being described here. Cause it seems like he's kind of fed up with something that's happening regularly um, versus a kid who is habitually staying up till 3am and missing class in the morning. I, I don't know that those two things are the same. So for example, um, I think even if a student is up until 3am at a jazz club and they are a jazz student, uh, they, at some point, they do kind of have to make a decision. Am I a jazz student or am I a jazz consumer? Um, mm -hmm. Because the, because the class is important. And and now the point you make about uh, asking himself why it is that they're missing and uh, you know what is he uh, you know what is he possibly not teaching to uh, to inspire the kids to come. I think that's a valid question. Uh, because I think that's true of that should be something we ask every teacher should ask themselves that 
um, about every class that we take? Are we providing value for our students? Uh, and so it's, it's just an interesting thing. I, I do want to ask your opinion about the, un, un, the other part towards the end of, the, of his post, and this is still Jeffrey Kieser's post. Um, the culture of everybody gets an A. Everybody gets a medal regardless of students' blatant disrespect for their lesson plans and their teachers, etc. So again, um, I think there's a valid criticism there. Um, I think that there we have, in fact, there's been, I saw a recent article about higher ed grading uh, has, has gone very, very steep towards a, a very high percentage of students getting A's and what does that do uh, to their perception of what it means to be successful, uh, et cetera. And so is there, is there any merit in um, this idea that if students feel, feel super strongly that they're going to get an A because most kids do, does that demotivate them to show up on time? Is that a continuously uh, perpetuating circle, I guess? Is that a valid criticism? Absolutely it is. And, mm -hmm. and I said to a student in, in my conducting class yesterday, look, you are a fine conductor. You should get an A in this class. But if you continue on this trajectory of tardies, you'll be lucky to get out of this class with a C because the syllabus clearly states, you know, that mm -hmm. coming in 15 minutes late in class will take off X amount of points. And um, I, so I think that it's imperative. But what I would say is that I can have a conversation with a student and say, you're talented, you're hardworking. I know there's a lot going on in your life, but we have a contract between you and me that says you will do this and I will do this to disseminate this information and and, and for you to learn this information. And if you don't do these things, then the only way that I have to show that you didn't keep up your part of the contract is with a grade. And I actually have given, I, I, I was complaining about this to a colleague, I have given more C's in choir since the pandemic than I have ever given. And it's not a lack of grace, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real emphasis on honesty and saying to students, look, you can't miss seven rehearsals in a choir. Um, and, and get an A in this choir. It's not going to work that way. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. And so I, well, I guess what, I, what I'm really curious about is the people who reacted negatively uh, to that post. I wonder what it is exactly that we're reacting negatively to, other than uh, hmm. you mentioned the kind of the disagreement about the, how to interpret the Smalls uh, Jazz Club question. I feel like it's kind of mostly just tone. In other yeah, words, I think, I think it's co a combination of tone. Like you said, there was an awful lot of kid get off of my lawn sort of feeling on it. Yep. If you want to do what I do, you have to be better. And, you know, and I understand that, that, you know, here is a guy at the top of his profession teaching at the most recognizable named music school in the world. And there's a lot of, I mean, I, I, automatically I respect people who are teachers at Juilliard because we know that they're all fine artists. Um, but we don't know that they're all fine teachers. And For that, sure. And that's what the rebuttal said. And so I think that part of the outrage, and you know, I have friends on all sides of all issues. I think part of the outrage rage was just the lack of self-reflection. It was completely the kids' fault. They don't come to class, they don't practice, they don't study. No wondering why. Why are they not coming to class? What's getting in the way of their practicing? Why aren't they studying? You know, and to bring it back to what I was saying at the beginning of this, I could have yelled at my basses and tenors today in rehearsal. That would have done nothing. So instead, we made a solution and we spent 15 minutes learning notes. I don't like to plunk notes. I'm a college music, you know, professor. So for all of those who think that we have it made and we never have to sit behind the piano, and play out parts. That's just not the way it is. At least not at most music schools. Right. Today was a example of that, and it, and it was a humbling moment for me. You know that because Aaron Copeland's not really all that hard to sing, but my guys just couldn't do it today. And so yeah. instead of screaming at them, I said, "Circle the piano and let's get to work." And I think that that was what people were upset about. Chris was that there wasn't a sense in that original post of. What do we do about this? It was just yelling at the kids. You want this career? Well, you better learn how to be professional. Well, how do we teach them to be professional? Yeah. You know, I have, I had a student who's I have a student who has a really hard time making it to class on time, and I happen to know that his hero in the whole world is 
one of my colleagues in the choral conducting field. Well, I was at ACDA last year and I had my colleague record a, a, a video for him to say, hey, just get to class on time. It'll change everything in your life. And I sent it to the student from ACDA and guess what? It made a difference. I made it, in his case, it really did make a difference because, you know, my, my friend started with, hey, Dr. Tauberg tells me you're a wonderful musician. You're a great singer. You know, you, your voice is beautiful. You know, you love, you love making music with your friends. The next step for you is to get the professionalism, you know, going. And some of our students just don't necessarily know what that is. Yeah. And I think yeah, that's no, true I, at Juilliard too. I think it's true at Juilliard. It's true at Eastman. It's true at Cincinnati. Yeah. You know, I, I taught freshmen at Cincinnati and we had to have the conversation about getting to class on time. And these right. were kids at a conservatory, you know, at a real conservatory. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think there is a, there's a certain aspect that where if kids don't know, kids of any age, even young adult kids, um, don't know how to do the thing, whatever it fill in the blank thing is, uh, it is the responsibility of the teacher to figure out what do I do next with these kids where they are. And I think there is a, um, a certain aspect in, especially at elite collegiate type programs of it's not my job to teach you to do the thing. It's your job to get yourself to this level so that, so that I can then do what I do. Right. So there, there, that does exist. I, I, I wonder though, and I want to actually go back to your tenors and basses that in your story to see what you think about this. So in that scenario, yes, of course you yelling at them would do no good, but is there the concern that if, if they, get through that rehearsal scot-free, so to speak, without any kind of admonishment at all, that that behavior just continues. Yes, absolutely. And that's why I told them I'd hear them sing this trio section in trios. Right. On what, happens, what happens if they don't know it at that test? Then they have demonstrated in front of 55 of their collegiate colleagues that they didn't do their homework. Right. And then that, that embarrassment takes care of it, it the, for you, and you don't have to yell at them for it. I won't yell. I'll just say, okay, next, please. Right. Yep. And then that, that peer pressure t kicks in. Yeah, I do the, I do similar things. You know, I'll, I'll share a story of my own. So we have um, our state, you know, large ensemble festival coming up here in Missouri in just a little while, a couple weeks, actually. And my chamber choir um, is has a, a monumental load on their plate for that event because the way our program works is the upper level kids perform all of the all of the kids music in addition to their own because we uh, essentially I insert them as uh, ringers in with the younger kids for those events so that they have that leadership and those more mature voices around them and you know all of that so they not only have to learn their repertoire for the event but they learn uh, two other choirs uh, repertoire as well and so it's a lot and I'm I'm, re I'm understanding of that but we also had uh, a, a, s a certain sequence of notes and rhythms that actually we're, we're doing the Eric Whitaker with the Lily, uh, which was super, super popular. Everybody did it 15 years ago, but you know, it's not as common anymore. So the kids these days have no idea what that song is. It's, and it's pretty hard. Um, and my sopranos are struggling with the rhythms, right? And we've gone several weeks into it where the instruction has been at the next rehearsal, we need to know how to sing this. And, and that, in that group, I, I'm able to have that kind of send that expectation home. And we came back the next rehearsal and we had no idea what was going on. Like they, it was, it was still equally as wrong as it was the weekend, the week before. So what I did, and I'm not a yeller, right? Um, I just, it's just not part of my personality. So they're not going to get like a, like a coach, coach months explosion, kind of a, you know, podium stomping kind of thing for me. It's just not part of my personality. But instead, what I did was very similar to your idea was I, what I do in that situation is I make them go stand in mixed quartets around the room. Um, and so that they're completely separated from anyone in their, their section. And we work those, those parts for a very similar reason. And then sometimes we'll go around this quartet, it's your turn to sing it, this quartet, it's your, your turn. And then suddenly they're one on a part. Uh, and it does the same thing. It exposes them to the reality that they are not prepared. But what I'm seeing, what I see with kids, kids these days, air quotes, um, is that even if I don't yell, simply exposing to themselves the, their lack of preparation 
uh, is sometimes off-putting to them. In other words, they, we, I do see more and more kids expecting to just be told that they're awesome. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, like it's kind of a, a response to, uh, it's a different response to that honesty than I might have gotten in, in the past, even if I say it to them in a very kind and loving way, which is that you're, you are not prepared and we can't accept this level of preparation, this has to be fixed. You know, that kind of a thing. Um, it, even that gets a different response. Thoughts? Well, I think there is a fragility. I'm, I'm thinking of a student that a couple of weeks ago, um, I had an assignment. You know, I don't know if you ever do the thing where you have them hold their phone and they sing into their phone. Yeah. And then, mm-hmm. they, then they send you the, the voice recording. I did this and I had a student who didn't send the voice recording. And I sent him a message and said, hey, I need you to send send me the voice recording from Oh dear, what can the matter be? And so if you didn't make it, record it again today and send it to me. And they didn't send it. And so then I reminded them a third time and was met with a request to withdraw from the class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, so, that's this, a- this is a college level audition to ensemble. The student had been a music major. They told me in the email that they've decided they're going to change their major. And I don't know whether my saying you need to be personally responsible for singing the right notes and the right words at the right time um, was was one of the factors that caused them to change their major. But the truth is, from my perspective, if it was, that's okay. Um, yes. I hope they'll keep singing. I hope they'll join a choir that maybe doesn't have the same standards of excellence and personal responsibility, but I'm not going to stop expecting, you know, per, the, the collegiate um, music majors or those singing in a choir that's mostly made up of collegiate music majors. They're not all music majors, but I'll tell you that most of the hardest working students in those choirs, as you can imagine, are the engineering majors or the, the history okay. majors. you know, those people who aren't music majors and maybe choir is the only music they get in their day as opposed to music majors who are preparing for juries and master classes and the opera or vocal jazz or whatever is the other thing going on in their life. Um, so to answer your question, Chris, yes, they are more fragile. Do yeah. I see them as being more fragile? Yes, I do. Um, mm-hmm. Has it changed the way I teach? Yes, it has. Has it lowered my standards of what makes for excellent singing? No, it hasn't. Yeah. And I would agree with that. I, I would say it has changed. And I want to make sure um, that anyone listening kind of understands there's some nuance here too, because it has changed my teaching as well. And I would say in most ways for the better, uh, hmm. in in that, like in the way I, like, it's not a bad thing that I, I think more about how the words I'm going to use to explain the honest standard that I'm trying to express how those how those words might impact a student, because right. I do since since COVID I I and and just really since this cultural shift over the last four or five years, I think about it more. But I also agree with you that I'm not willing to let it change my standard of what's academically expected in the classroom, because right. I believe that that standard is for a reason, and I believe that standard actually benefits those students, whether whether they're whether they're feeling a little bit fragile about hearing it at the moment or not, I'm willing to make that investment in them long term because I care about them. And I think as it, it, the, my part of my job is making sure that they understand that when they're getting that feedback, whether it's an admonishment of some kind or, or whatever that they're getting. I think maybe this is where a good place to bring that tough love response from the other person back in, because that's kind of how I think of it. I think of it as tough love. Some people don't like that term. They, they have negative feelings about that term. But to me, that's what tough love is. It's I, because I care about you, I'm going to tell you the thing that you need to hear, uh, even though you might not want to hear it. Thoughts about sure. that and tough hey, love? I think- I don't have, I mean, you know, we live in America. Two people can say the exact same thing using different language and the other side will be completely offended. Yep. Uh, And and so I just don't buy into that. And, and, and um, I don't know if you had the opportunity to read the coddling of the American mind um, in the last few years. Yes, I have Uh, read it. But, um, you know, my colleague, Christine Guter, who runs the vocal jazz program at Long Beach, which we've been, you know, dear friends and colleagues for over 20 years. And we read it together when we realized that our students were changing and, and that at some level, both of us tenured full professors 
we're afraid of saying something that might offend a student that might put us in front of the dean. And we thought, we can't teach this way. We're not going to teach this way. And we sort of made a blood pack and said, you know, what we do is good teaching. Our students are, are they're, ed- they're going on to be great educators and Grammy winning performers. And, and we should be very proud of that. And the students who come to study with us need to understand that we're going to be radically honest with them. And so you you say tough love. I say radical honesty in an anti-fragile classroom. Yep. And, and I think that that that's what I'm going for. I, you know, I have a student who is he's so fun and and I just love this human. And he he comes to my office and and he grew up in Oakland and in, in, in a really dis you know so, socially disadvantaged neighborhood. And he'll come to my office and just say, Hey, Dr. T, I just thank you for being just so direct with us today. Like we all know where we stand with you and you know, that's good. We need that. We need that. And I just appreciate that students, they, I think they do need it. They yeah. really do. Think they need it. Now I'm not teaching eighth grade, you know, <laughs> eighth grade uh, tenors and basses with combiata voices and, you know, who are trying to figure out their lives in the same way. And right. we're just everything we can to keep them singing. Right. Yep. But I do think that, that, what I would give, what I would give the professor at Juilliard is, he is right to say you should come to class on time. You should do your homework. You should prepare for your lessons. Right? I mean, you know, I, I heard you do a thing recently where you said, you know, it took you a, a couple of years to get. I don't remember which which podcast it was, Chris, but you were talking about, you know, yourself as a as a as a voice student, you know, and yeah. and. And, and I was I was that way too. I mean, I was a, I was a music ed major, and and I didn't put the time into the studio that I should have. And one of my piano teachers said to me, "You know, if you actually practiced, you'd be good." Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, but if I practiced, I would have to practice. You know. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and piano wasn't my principal instrument at that point; it was voice. You know. But I do think that th- those those things haven't changed. It's just the language that he used. Yeah. And the lack of reflection, as we talked about before. Yeah, exactly. and, and and I think, uh, and in this, there's a response here I'd like to get to jump into now. And I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this per- correctly, but James Falzone or Falzoni, if he kind of does the American Italian thing, I'm not sure. Um, it posted a long, quite a bit longer response than the original post. Um, okay. and, and, and in some ways, uh, and I'll post this one as well on the show notes, in, in some ways, it's, it reads as a criticism. Uh, I do, I have to say, I did read a lot also of assumptions in, in it of what the original post meant. Uh, in other words, I did see, I did see what I felt like was a lot of projecting, um, of, of thoughts onto Mr. Keezer's post, which was very short and, and had, you know, some very concrete sets of criticisms in it. Uh, but, but then he goes on to add a lot of things. So let me just kind of skim a little bit of it here for the listening audience, um, this is a response to the recent post from pianist Jeffrey Kieser and his experience with students at Juilliard, where he teaches jazz. The original has been shared 800 times, so so James seemed to have, you know, re-responding to what seemed to be a popular post. Um, and James says, I have been teaching in higher education for 22 years, and the last eight years I've been involved in leadership positions, first as chair of music department and now a dean. And... And then I'm skipping down, but something about the tone of and lament, and even more concerning the disrespectful comments that have ensued from others about kids today, has him flummoxed or concerned. And so then he goes on to write uh, all of these posts, which kind of supports my thought as I, I was giving before about I think it's the tone largely that people are reacting to here. Um, but I want to skip down to some of the the key points, and then we can talk about them. Uh, because I think this is where he does what you were suggesting we, that we should do with information like this, which is to reflect on possible underlying causes for students to be maybe not showing up for class or not to be finding that education valuable at 9 a.m. or whatever. And he says, higher education is in shambles. Uh, and he goes on to explain uh, a lot of reasons for this, but uh, teaching at the college level and you're not aware, then you are not paying attention, is what he says. Much of this has been brought on by ourselves as a society that is in lo- in a love affair with rampant capitalism, uh, a word that I'm positive he is using incorrectly here, uh, but also by a host of policy decisions stemming back to the Reagan era and continuing through Obama, Trump, and Biden. So he's talking a little bit about the finances of college being 
just wildly out of control. So yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a big issue. Another one he says is providing content versus teaching. Um, are we instructing the students that we have or are we just kind of, like I said before, here's the level, it's your job to get to my level and then I will give you my knowledge kind of a thing. Um, and then a less of focus on the individual, more attention to the whole. As this is a long post, I encourage people to read it. But uh, now what I'm interested in here, you reposted this person's post. So something in there resonated with you. Uh, tell us about that. What what made you see this post and go, ah, yes, this, this is how we should be thinking about this. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think there's, there's a couple of things. Obviously, we've already talked about the fact that I like I like the fact that Falzone put it, Falzone, Falzone, I don't, again, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> but he, he, he put the, the onus of responsibility on the teacher to figure out what was wrong. You know, my dad was a teacher, Chris, and he used to say, if you give an assignment and 80% of the class fails the test, you didn't explain it very well. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and yeah. we know that. We're lifelong teachers. We understand that. So I liked the 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 the, the really he, he's admonishing the, the education profession to you know not not to throw stones in in a glass house, and the glass house and, and the fact that that higher ed is in shambles in many places. I would say that it's not in shambles everywhere, um, and I think that that's an important distinction. Yep. And every university, every college is not in shambles. We do have a major problem in this country with underfunding um, full-time professors. And so we have a lot of people who, and I don't know about Professor Kieser. I didn't, I don't know if he's full-time. I don't know if he's just being paid as an adjunct to come in and teach his class and leave. But in my experience, there's an awful lot of people who are being paid to go in, deliver content, and then go to the next school that they're working at to deliver similar content, maybe up to four community colleges so that they can feed themselves. Um, and administration has figured out how to save a lot of money, which is why I would argue with you that I don't think he's misusing capitalism, actually. I think that that is part of his criticism. I don't, I don't agree with it, but I do think that when you hire people who have MBAs to run universities, you have automatically um, prioritized what you, you have put the the finance business part of the university above the education part of the university. And we've seen that all over in the country. Um, you know, if I use my school as an example, I, again, I, I'm a tenured full professor, so I can say this without fear of reprisal. When I started at Long Beach State, there were 24 full-time faculty to teach about 300 students. Now there are 19 full-time faculty and we have over 500 students. Wow. And that's in the case across the country. And so you end up with angry professors who maybe don't have the bandwidth to sit down with this student and say, hey man, why aren't you coming to my nine o'clock class? Mm-hmm. That's, yep. that's one of the things that I think Falzone is, is getting at. Right. So he's addressing a system underneath the problem um, that, that, isn't, that isn't the student's fault. It's not the teacher's fault, but at the same time, it is still, like we were talking about the, for the first part of our conversation, it is still valid to tell the student, you got to show up to class. Absolutely. Uh, Right, and so I think both of these things can be true at at the same time. In that, uh, it, because you were talking about your dad, ex your dad's example of if if I give a test and eighty percent of the kids don't know it, um, then that is a teacher problem. That is the teacher didn't Correct. explain it well, unless I would say, unless they're not showing up to class, um, mm -hmm. in which case that is not the teacher's fault, and and teachers should um, should not pile every responsibility on ourselves for our own sanity. Uh, there, 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 there is a certain amount of um, um, boundary that we have to have with what can I control. Um, and of course, as a teacher, I can control what the kid is hearing when they come in my classroom, but I can't control if they don't come. Uh, I, can, I can hope to inspire that they come. Uh, I can hope to make my class relevant. Uh, all of those things that we talked about. But uh, now I will say, okay, so here is why I said that it wasn't uh, the right use of capitalism. In higher ed, 
Um, it are in the U.S. Our our financing for higher ed is so intertwined with taxpayer dollars. I don't know that it's a fair use of the word. In other words, we don't have a market um, that is that is free of government regulation in the same way that we have. That when we when most people hear the word capitalism, they think like buying buying and selling commodities in a in a free market. Um, and we in higher ed we don't have that. And I, I actually saw. Um, I saw that in his post, which is why I kind of brushed it off um, as a as just a term that people throw because he did, I think, correctly admonish uh, presidents of multiple uh, administrations and both parties uh, in in kind of getting us to where we're at right now with how expensive higher ed is, and it has a lot to do with how it's paid for. Um, right. You know, and how and it and how it's paid for is isn't really capitalism in that in that it's so much so wrapped up in in government policy, um, and so sometimes sometimes in, and I think in the United States we get down in this rabbit hole a lot because uh, we are a very much a mixed economy in the United States. We have capitalist aspects and we have very taxpayer funded regulated aspects as well. Um, thoughts about that or any of those things? I just said a lot well, of things. I mean, you, you bring up a really good point. And I, and I would say you're right. I mean, you're talking every, I think every school in the country, except for Hillsdale, which is a, a small college in the South, takes federal money. Mm -hmm. you know, every, every university. And certainly my school, which is, you know, the large, it's a campus of the largest university in the world. Um, you know, one campus and one of the largest three campuses of that largest university in the world. We are really reliant on state support and on, on federal dollars. But at the same time, our percentage of state support has really dropped in California compared to where it was when I was a student. Right. Um, and, and so along with all of, you know, higher ed, I, I think that, you know, there's just a lot more administrators and a lot fewer teachers. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's something that Dean Falzone is working on at his at his institution. I mean, I, I hope that he's he's aware that you know every time you hire a second vice you know vice president in charge of Title Twenty Six, right. that it's a professor that you're not hiring. Yep. Uh, but certainly, we see that at the Cal State. Yeah. No, that's and I'm so glad you brought that up because at when we're talking about how expensive higher ed has become. And this is hard, hard for people to wrap their minds around. But part of that is that when the government gives you money, things cost more. And, and that, that's, that's exactly, you just nailed it on the head, which is we, we depend on this money uh, for our university. But the problem is when they give us the money, it comes with strings. And one of those strings is you now have to have all these departments of all these compliance things with all these things that you're now beholden to, which means more administrators, more pencil pushers, more offices of X, Y, Z, um, because they have to meet the standard that comes with the money. And so then, and then in the political conversation, all we ever have is, well, they just need to give us more money. Um, and, and we don't ever talk about whether or not we're spending the money in a way that is efficient. And of course, in the higher ed, uh, in particular, over the last 10 years, we've exploded how much we're spending outside of the higher ed classroom on other things on campus. Sure. Is that something you're seeing too? And Well, I mean, the only thing that I have seen as an explosion is that we are hiring many more counselors. And I would say that we desperately need them. I'm, and I'm talking about mental health counselors. Oh, we do need them. Yeah. As we've talked about, um, that it's something, and that actually is one of the reasons that the Cal State faculty did a strike. It was a short strike, um, but it was in order to increase the counselor to student ratio on, mm -hmm. on campus. Um, I mean, I think it's just been a slow creep of administration, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because at the department level, we still have, you know, the same people in the main office as we've always had, even though even though we're serving, you know, an extra 200 students from when I was hired a, a quarter of a century ago. Um, it, the, it, the, the creep, the administrative creep is at, at the, you know, in, in the in the upper suites so often. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really, yeah, that's really well said. And I agree. And, and that's kind of when I say outside of the classroom, that's kind of what I mean. You know, yeah. Just like thing, things that don't directly relate to teacher pay, teacher resources to teach the class, 
educational experiences directly that uh, that go towards right. students. Um, Tours, you know, I, I, accompanists. Yeah, oh, sure. Uh, yeah. You know, all mm-hmm. that coaching hours, the things that would make a real difference in the students' lives. Yep. Um, and all of yep. those institutions. Because oftentimes the strings attached to that money don't don't require those things, strangely. <laughs> they're they're because they come from that's the thing people forget about is that all the money if you're talking about government should spend money on something you're talking about a politician a politician should give me that money and people think like there's this whole mythology of like uh well the government is of the people and by the people and you know it is on paper but ultimately it's somebody who wants to get reelected is deciding you know so they all have their they all have their agendas, but that's probably for a different podcast completely. Um, I I do want to jump into this post again, and I want to get your reaction to another part of it. Um, it's towards the end. Um, so this is again Falzone Falzoni. Um, so he says towards the end, my advice to anyone who shares Professor Kieser's lament is to talk about it with fellow faculty members. Uh, ask your chair or dean for, for advice, and generally bring the problem out in the open. You might be surprised you are not the only one experiencing the issue or that specific students may be exhibiting this behavior in other classrooms. It may not be about you at all, and the ad nauseum excuses provided by the students are camouflaging for mental health issues, vocational questioning, performance anxiety, or a host of other stressors. If we take a student's seemingly lack of interest, seeming lack of interest as blatant disrespect, we are putting ourselves and our egos before their education. Now, this was the part of the post that resonated with me the most. Um, I agreed with, actually, that's so what's weird about the internet, is I actually agreed with both of their posts, and I didn't find I didn't find them to be in, really even in all that conflict with each other, other than just tone, right? But I really, really resonated with this particular paragraph because this is something I feel like that I've learned for myself as a teacher to be better at over the last five or six years is to not assume that when the student is not doing the thing that I think they should be doing in the classroom, that that is, a, that's directly an admonishment of me. Um, that, that, that they're, they, they've got something going on because they, they wouldn't be in my class. You know, we both teach classes that people choose to be in. Like they, even at the high school level, they're choosing to be in choir. They wouldn't have chosen to be in my class if at some level they didn't want to be there. And if they're being a jerk to me in my class or whatever, there's something going on. And I used to just assume, and I would, I would assume that they were being disrespectful to me. And, and I, now I'm a little bit more compassionate about trying to figure out what is going on with that kid. Uh, before I get to that, hey, you're not being respectful, this behavior has to stop, you know, whatever, because I, there, I, we do still have to hold a line of what is acceptable behavior, but the, it seems like what he's, he's encouraging us to do is start almost like triage, like let's, let's figure out what's going on first before we get all pissed off. Uh, is that kind of how you read it as well? I think you nailed it, and I think when you talk about the way that you have grown, um, you know, that's a growth mindset. And, and, and what you are exhibiting is good teacher evolving over a career. I think when we're all young, it's all about us. When we first start teaching, mm-hmm. it becomes all about them and it's more all about them. I mean, the great Eve Ely used to ask the question, are we teaching music to people or are we teaching people through music? Mm-hmm. And I think that that's true at every level. And if it's not true, and I'm talking Juilliard, Michigan, Cincinnati, Indiana also, then why are you teaching? You know, if you're, if you think you're teaching music to people instead of teaching people through music, then you've missed the boat. And I think that that's what he's, he's leaning into in in that post. And I think that's why it resonated with you so well. I mean, you know, Chris, you're an open-minded guy and you're, and you're thick skinned, right? So you don't mind somebody saying, get your butt to class on time. My kids are there. I don't understand. Like, you know, and, and, and I'm, and I'm kind of that way too. I, you know, I, I want, like I said, I want radical honesty. Um, but I think that the second post has a lot more useful information for those of us who are educators than just being a scold for the kid who can't get to class on time. Yeah. Cause we all have that kid. Mm-hmm. We all have. That. And if we have a lot of those kids, then it's really our job to look inwards and to talk, like you said, talk to your colleagues, you know, what are you doing? I mean, I just did a whole session um, in, in Washington on building, rebuilding and maintaining your choral program. And 
we were just laughing about how it just cycles. Once you're in its job long enough, you're always rebuilding, you're always building, you're always maintaining all at the same time. And I, I think that you have to look inwards to say, are things working? You know, are students coming to sing with me? Are they not coming to sing with me? You know, yeah. um, students yeah. don't flock to me. students don't flock to mediocrity. And Juilliard's an exception, right? Because students want to go there because it's the one music school. It's the only music school whose name they've known their whole life. Yeah, that's a good point. That's their 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 recruiting um, aspect is. Um, is quite a bit different. Uh, just just a quick little anecdote. My, what I grew up working for a college and university admissions research firm. That was I, I started working in the mailroom for this company at age fourteen because it was my dad's company. Uh, uh-huh. That was what he did for a living. Um, and one of the things he used to try to explain to me uh, is I would ask him. He had like probably fifteen hundred different collegiate college uh, clients around the country. And I would ask him if his if the famous schools were his clients. Like, so do you have Harvard as a client, and do you have Yale as a client? And he would say no. And I would be like, oh, always disappointed. Why don't you have those schools? And he said they don't need help recruiting. They don't need help with uh, with how to how to reach students. Everybody knows who they are already. My clients are the are the schools that are trying to get their their name out there, and you'd put Juilliard in that category of of one that uh, and 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 it could be. And I'm, this is again. I'm projecting and I'm making assumptions here, but it could be that if I'm teaching at a at a Juilliard, I would I would maybe struggle with that ego piece a little bit. Not because I'm a bad person, but because I'm in this place where I've t- I've got a mythology built up around where I am, where they need to meet my standard. I'm not going to come to them. They they I meet I meet their they're here here for my to absorb my knowledge. And I might not mean to be that way, but I, I, I can imagine being that way if I taught there. I don't know. Thoughts about that? Well, I, f- I find myself going back to working at the Aspen Music Festival. And um, I was David Zinman's assistant. Um, and he would be work- working at the American Academy of Conductors. And we had students who studied with a particular teacher at Juilliard who were so tight on the podium that they basically couldn't make music. And and Zinman, who was a wonderful educator, but also could be very direct and and you know, he's major, major, you know, voice of the of the 20th century, would say to them, Where is this tension coming from? And I remember one of them saying, Have you ever met my teacher? <laughs> and, and and I do think that there is, I mean, if you know, I'm I'm not a I'm not a composer, but if I was gonna go study with John Carigliano, you would th- think I would do my homework, right? Before I showed up. Like yeah. To stay to stay with the, the Juilliard thing, right? Um, so I am sure that he has that Kieser has a has a ego that is appropriate to the career that he's built for himself. Yeah, but that doesn't mm-hmm. negate his responsibility to meet his students where they are at and take them to the next level. And I think that's again what people were upset about. That's a that's a really good summary. That's a really good summary, uh, and I think yeah, I think that that's uh, a really well said. Uh, what I what I'd like to do because uh, we've been at this for about an hour, so I'd like to wrap it up a little uh, with some final thoughts. If you, um, it, it, I'm going to ask you to do the meanest thing at the end of a podcast that I could possibly do, and I'm going to ask you to predict the future. So in in all of these things that we're talking about, so are you know are the kids okay? The kid are, are the kids different than pr- past generations? Um, do you see it getting better or worse? Uh, but in the amount of time that you have left in your career, however long that is, um, and you know, do so you, do you see it getting better or worse and why, uh, what are the factors that you kind of predict coming down the road, especially since you mentioned reading coddling them of the American mind. I'm now very curious to see what your opinion about this is. And trust me, I will not put this like 10 years from now. I'm not going to put this as a time capsule to prove you right or wrong. I promise. Okay. Well, I, I'm an I'm an eternal optimist, so I like to believe that it's getting better. Um, we have come out. So I'm an eternal optimist. I like to believe that it's getting better. We have come out of the uh, the pandemic, and students love to be in class. Um, they are showing up mostly prepared most of the time. Um, in California, we have passed a thing called Prop 28, which is in infused a lot of money into many of our schools, especially those schools in the poor neighborhoods 
Um, and so I think that music education in my home state, which is, you know, a big proportion of the American population is going to get better over the next 10 years. Um, do I think the student mental health crisis is going to get better? I think a lot of that is going to depend upon um, how we negotiate public spaces online and conversations about, about these things. Um, I think that parents have let their children down in some ways by not policing what they're doing online when they're way too young to be doing it online. And I'll let you read into that whatever you want to. Yeah, I fully uh, agree. I'm not a parent. And so let me say that, but I have students, you know, who are, who are still so wrapped up in internet dramas that matter a lot to them right now, but that they shouldn't really need the bandwidth to deal with. Um, and, and I know it's worse at the high school and the middle school level. And I just wonder where the parenting is, you know, when it comes to those, those little devices we all have, you know, for every, there's a thousand people in, in Silicon Valley who are trying to figure out how to keep us addicted to our phones all the time. Yep. And um, that's their job. And, you know, my rehearsal space is a phone free space and it's worked really, really well for me and really, really well for my students. And I think they appreciate knowing that for an hour or two hours, their phones are unavailable and they are a hundred percent in it to win it with their other real living humans. That's great. Um, but I think that it's a real issue that we need we need academic study and we need to understand, we need researchers to try and figure out how it's affecting our brains, you know, the dopamine of being liked or disliked or upvoted or downvoted. Um, I, I think that that's something that we just are barely, I mean, we're in the infancy. My, my husband always says we are we're teenagers. We're all teenagers when it comes to our online behavior, because it's only been around long enough for us to be teenagers. And I think that's a really interesting take on it. So yeah. I do think the kids are all right to use a seventies analogy. I think every generation, you know, I mean, we, we joked around with kids. I don't know what's wrong with these kids today. Bye bye birdie is, you know, late fifties, early sixties. Right. And then you get into hair in the late, late 60s and the movie hair in the 70s and you know there's always every generation looks at the generation after them and, and pulls their hair out and says what's happening to these people in my experience now teaching my third generation of humans to sing you know I'm, I'm a gen xer and my first you know I, I i started teaching high school at 23 so i was you know, I, I had I was teaching Gen Xers, and then I taught a whole generation of millennials, and now I've got the um, the Zennials. They're all different, but they're all beautiful humans who want to make art and want to find community and want to serve. And so I do believe that um, the kids are okay, and they're going to be okay in a decade. I think I think the pandemic was really, really, really hard. And we're still seeing that. You're yep. still seeing that in high school. I know you are. Yep. Uh, so it's just going to get better from here. Yeah, I yeah I agree with with that, and that's all so well said. So thank you, Jonathan, for spending an hour with me. This was a blast, and I hopefully we got some people thinking. I hope so. It was it was great talking to you. Awesome. Thank you all for listening to this episode. As always, the way that we keep Coralosophy moving into the future. We just hit five years, and the way we hit five more years and continue to grow and expand the way that this platform can be valuable to you, the listener, and can continue to be valuable to the music education landscape is you being involved. The ways that you can be involved, of course, are entering the Coralosophy promo code at all the websites that allow that. They are amazing partners that have been with us mostly since the beginning. That's sightreadingfactory.com, mymusicfolders.com, that is also endeavorpublishing.com, and graphitepublishing.com. You can also, of course, go over to Ludus and check out their products. You can do the things directly for the show that help, like go to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and chip in three bucks a month. And if you can't do any of those things, I just want you to join the conversation. So head on over to the Coralosophers Facebook page, 
like, share, leave comments anywhere that you're able to see the content. Those help other people join the conversation as well. We are building a movement here and we want you to be a part of it. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.